Hey everybody, Amy here with the final installment of Dueling Rabbits Productions' groundbreaking study of a drawloom project from start to finish. So get yourself a cup of coffee and settle in for a bit more setup, a lot of weaving, and the big reveal. In part three of the series, we made a lot of progress setting up the drawloom. We connected single unit draw cords to 22 pattern leashes and distributed all 115 of the leashes to their 17 pattern shafts. We finished assembling the console of the mirror head combination attachment. When we parted company at the end of the episode, I promised we were almost ready to weave. Today we're going to do a few final flourishes on the setup, do some rough weaving to check for mistakes, fine tune the damask shed, and weave our scarf. That's a lot, so let's get going. One final thing I like to do before double checking the setup is bring all the warp threads, currently in two layers on the tie-on bar, into a cord. I like to use the magic string method I learned from Becky Ashenden. It's quick, effective, and cuts down on the need for a wide footer. When I tied on, I made sure I was consistent with my knots, so that for each, the bundle closest to the outside of the loom goes over the bar. I take up a long piece of seine twine and pass it over the upper bundles and under the lower bundles, bringing them to the same level. Every so often, I press the string towards the bar and pull it tight. When I've done all the bundles, I like to use the beater to push the string as far as it will go. I secure the string in the hole at the end of the bar and pat the warp for good luck. I am now ready to do a visual inspection of my setup. We are standing at the front of the loom looking at the warp side on. Thanks to our efforts, all of the ends are nice and level as they approach the tie-on bar. They are going through the center of the reed and sloping gently down to the eyes of the pattern heddles. From there, the warp slopes gently upwards to the back beam. Let's back up and look at the ground shafts with their long eye heddles. It is very important for the mechanics of the thing that the warp at rest is lying just at the bottom of the long eyes. Sometimes something like this happens, especially if a thick warp thread is being used or there are lots of pattern shafts. Even though the ground shafts are level and the long eyes aligned with one another, some of the warp ends are riding up in the eyes. If we cast our eyes further along the warp to the pattern leashes, we can see the problem, baggy leashes. The weight on the leashes is not sufficient to extend them to their full length. This is a problem that is easily solved with an extra lingo or two on each leash, which pulls the ends down to where they need to be. There is another check I like to do when I've changed the setup on my loom especially if I have a wildly different number of pattern shafts than I did for my previous project. I hang a plumb line and check the shed made by my raised pattern shafts. My plumb line is just another length of seine twine, long enough to reach from the front to the back of the loom. I weight it with lingos to keep it in place. Here it is, running from the front beam and through the reed and lee sticks, but otherwise unencumbered over the back beam. Here's the side view as it travels past the pattern leashes. Now, if I just raise some pattern shafts at random, the plumb line should travel through the middle of the resulting shed. And it does. That's a really promising omen. If I'd needed to make an adjustment to bring the shed into line, I would have done so by raising or lowering the back beam as required, moving the support pins on either side in the holes on the bolster. At this point, confident that I've made all the preliminary checks I can, there's nothing for it but to press a treadle. I go to the countermarch and remove the support pin from the jacks. I hold my breath in case the worst happens and the entire apparatus crashes to the floor. Here's the view of the lambs and treadles while I remove the pin. Hopefully they will not sink too horribly when the jacks are no longer held in place. I remove the pin now. Gosh, that's another really good sign. Okay, let's see if we have any sort of shed at all. I'm going to cycle through all six of my ground shafts. 
My goal at this point is to have weavable sheds only. The fine tuning comes later. Since it is a rising shed, there's not a whole lot that can go wrong, except perhaps that my long lambs are not lifting their respective shafts high enough to let a shuttle pass through. These all look pretty good. The other thing I am looking for, off camera, is crossed threads obstructing the shed. I don't have any at this time, but if I did, the likely culprit would be two threads going through the reed in the wrong order. If I had any of those, they would have to be fixed before weaving could continue. But it all looks good to me so far, so I will weave a small footer to troubleshoot the setup some more. I typically use the same weft as I will for my project, but in this case, with the wool weft, I decided to use cotton to make the interlacements easier to see. At this point, I am checking for threading errors. Since I cannot yet use my temple, I must be very careful to guard against draw-in at this stage. I don't even worry about the selvages, but leave plenty of slack at the edges. Cursory examination of the cloth surface seems to indicate my ground shafts are threaded correctly, but for unit weaves, there's another checking method I really like. Rather than look at the cloth, I look at the threads at the top of the shed. I press a treadle and insert a white card. For my six-end satin, only one thread in six is raised, spread equally across the warp. It is easy to see against the card whether any of the gaps between raised threads are larger or smaller than the others. See how the threads are spaced equally across? I can tell I have threaded my ground shafts correctly. I would do this for every one of my six sheds. I know I have a weavable ground setup and that I don't have any threading errors. I've now switched to the pink wool I'm going to use for my piece, and you can see the ground structure pretty clearly. Isn't it pretty? It's going to make a great scarf. Now it's time to see if I have guessed my set correctly. When I am weaving figurative damask on my draw loom, it is very important to me that I be weaving as close to square as possible. In other words, every 6x6 six six thread unit must be equal in size, top to bottom, and side to side. My first attempt is here, with these two squares. Actually, they're 12x12, 12 12, so they are easier to measure. Even with the naked eye, I can see they are a bit squished. Not only will my design look foreshortened, but my cloth will be unbalanced and stiff, with too many weft threads packed in to a given unit of length. But it's close enough that I am not going to reslay my reed. Instead, I'm going to adjust my beat. I lighten up, and instead of thwacking twice, gently squish the weft into place after each pick. Already, I can see the cloth improving. And when I measure my new squares with my trusty tape measure, I see they are about as right as I can get them. I am ready to weave a sample of my pattern to see how it looks. And here it is. I've woven a few of the basket weave stripes and one repeat of the monk's belt flowers. I think I'm happy with the proportions of the design and can feel, even on the loom, that the cloth is not too stiff. But I do not like how I've designed the edges. These units on the X shaft, which looked good on my Fiberworks drawdown, are not working at all in real life. Not sure what I was thinking there. So I go back to my draft and do some tweaking to those rearmost units to make the design more harmonious. This is a very easy thing to do, since I've got three units at either edge of the piece to play with. I divide them up onto three shafts, which enable me to carry the basket weave stripes to the edge of the scarf in a logical way giving me a much more intentional, finished look. Making these changes to the pattern leashes is an easy task as well, since pattern heddles can be reorganized and new shafts added or taken away as a matter of course. Say I want to move these units to this shaft towards the back of the loom. I unhook both shafts from their cords. Since I don't want the leashes to get twisted, I remove this unit and hold it aside. I slide the units of interest off their shaft and thread them onto the new one. Replace the existing unit and, hey presto, done. I reattach the cords and am good to go. I can do these rearrangements anywhere in the warp or could even gather up all the units back onto a headling bar and redistribute for a completely new design if I choose. 
but these small changes are all I need for now. While I'm tweaking the setup of the loom, it's a good time to optimize the shed and to make sure everything is working smoothly. My sample will have told me whether I've got any problems that need addressing. What if I'd found that the floor of my shed was uneven, for example, and that my shuttle was catching and snagging threads instead of zipping smoothly over them? This usually happens when ends and raised pattern leashes, which are operating as a sinking shed, are not joining the ends resting at the bottom of the long eyes. In my experience, this is because the ends are being pulled down too far by the treadle. Good insurance against this issue is to tie up each treadle such that when it hits the floor, the lower bar on its associated ground shaft just kisses the gable of the loom. I'm pressing a treadle and it's hitting the floor now. See how when the bar touches the gable, the floor of the shed is perfectly smooth. That's what I want. Now I'm going to raise some pattern shafts at random and repeat the exercise. All the threads are joining the others obediently. But if I press this treadle, the shaft bar hits the gable while the treadle is still an inch off the floor, and I can feel it fighting back. The floor of the shed is not stable, and I know if I throw a shuttle it will not go zipping through. To fix this, I will lengthen the connection to the short lamp by moving the connector to the treadle one or two holes further down on the Texolf cord. This will lower the treadle and keep the shaft from being pulled down too far. Once we have the bottom of the shed taken care of, what about the top? The biggest problem here is usually that raised pattern units are not high enough in the shed and break when the shuttle collides with them at speed. There are two issues to consider. Are the raised units at the tops of the long eye heddles when they are pulled, and are all pattern leashes at the same height regardless of whether they are located at the front or the rear of the pack? Let's raise some single unit draw cords and see how they compare to the leashes on our pattern shafts. You can see how there's some unevenness in the ceiling of the shed. That's because there's not enough tension on the draw cords. They are not lifting their units to the same level as the leashes on the pattern shafts. I fix that by moving to the back of the loom and finessing the board sandwich that my draw cords are mounted on. I'm tightening it up. Do you see how the units are rising? I am accomplishing this by shifting the sandwich further back on the extension. These holes on the extension and in the boards themselves give me a fair amount of precision with which to work, more than I need, probably. We also want to make sure that the shafts and poles at the back of the loom lift to the same height as those at the front. Let's lift shafts 1 and 2, which are threaded at the front of the pack. They are lifting up these units here pretty high up as it happens. These units too. Now I lift up shafts 14 and 15, which are at the rear of the pack. Here's 1 and 2. Here's 14 and 15. They are at the same height. Now even though they are near to one another on the surface of the warp, they are quite far apart on their pattern shafts. Because I am using a relatively small number of shafts overall, the shafts can be lifted to the same height and they will be fine across the top of the shed. But if I were using more shafts, say 40 or 50, the geometry of the thing would dictate that the rear shafts be lifted higher for the ends to be at an equal height in front of the beater. That is why this bar is adjustable up and down. If I want all my pulls to appear higher in the shed, I would lower the bar so the pulls would have a greater distance to travel. If I wanted the poles on the right, that is, the shafts at the back of the loom, to go even further up, I would lower the right-hand side of the bar so it was at an angle. I had to do this for another piece, which needed all 41 of my pattern shafts. For lots of details about how to fine-tune your shed, including useful checklists and characteristics of the well-tempered draw loom, and lots more besides, I recommend Sarah Von Tresco's invaluable book, when a single harness simply isn't enough. I always keep my own well-worn copy close to hand. So now that I've got the design just how I want it and my loom is working well, it's time to get this show on the road. Here's my final Fiberworks draft. The leash configuration on 19 shafts is shown at the top. 
the lift plan for the pattern shafts is shown at the right. It's easy to see where the basket weave stripes are located on their shafts, but you have to squint a little to discern where the symmetrical motifs are. This is because only half of each figure is shown in the drawdown. The pattern shafts themselves fill in the blanks. Here to the left, on shafts 5 through 10, are the three motifs at the center and outer edges of the piece. Here to the right, on shafts 11 through 16, are the two remaining motifs. The squares destined for single pull Easter eggs are left blank on this drawdown. I have a separate schematic for those that I will refer to when the time comes. If I blow up the lift plan, you can see the numbers more clearly. Fiberworks automatically numbers the shafts front to back, which can take a little getting used to if you are accustomed to thinking about them the other way around, but it's not an insurmountable problem. On my loom, I use a label maker to number my shafts to match the plan. Here's the console optimized for the piece I'll be weaving. I've got my 19 shafts connected to pulls in the center. I've labeled the first shaft, the last shaft, and all the others in multiples of five. I find that a good compromise to keep the labels from being too crowded. The blue tape here is over the shafts where I've also got single draw cords. This reminds me that if I'm using the cords, none of the handles underneath the tape should be pulled. Since I'm not using all the handles, I like to loop the first of the idlers on either side over the bar. This makes it clearer to me where the relevant pulls are located. For now, let's use the pattern shafts only. We're picking up the weaving in media res. I've just finished weaving this horizontal stripe here. There it is. That's the last row that I wove, with the blue edge there, and there, and those three stripes. The units for all those stripes were on one shaft, shaft 3, which is already up, as are the selvage units on shaft 19. Let's set up for the next row. The first thing I have to do is pull the three additional vertical stripes there on shaft 1. It goes up, and there they all are, my new stripes. Here, here, and here. Now I have to set up for these three motifs. They're on shafts 5 through 10. My lift plan tells me I need to lift 5, 6, 7, 9, and 10. That will give me blue blocks everywhere except those pink points at the corners of the motif. You can see where the pink points will be woven under the card here, plus two more times across the warp. In the remaining two squares, I want to weave the opposite. The points will be blue, and the rest of the square will be pink. To do that, I pull one shaft only, 14. Raising that one shaft gives me all four points, these two, and these two. After all that, the weaving is really straightforward, because all I need to do to complete my six end units is treadle through my ground shafts from left to right. When I'm done, you can see I've woven the row just as it appears on my drawdown. Weaving with the pattern shafts is a simple matter of following my lift plan, and with an optimized setup, it's fairly easy to make progress quickly, efficiently, and without too many mistakes. But what if, in addition to my pattern shafts, I'm also weaving Easter eggs with my single draw cords? This adds another dimension to every row that I weave. Let's look at this section here, where I'm weaving a fox and a dog, in addition to my stripes and symmetrical motifs. We're looking at this section of the lift plan here, with the symmetrical motif on the left, and the blank space where my Easter eggs will go on the right. I'm ready to set up for this row here, right under the post-it. As before, I look to see which pattern shafts I will need to raise for this row. In this case, I need to raise seven of them. My Easter eggs are drafted separately. Here you see the fox and the dog. I also include the symmetric motif so I can double-check alignment. The highlighted columns mark the center of the square where my gray draw cords are. The black squares represent raised units. I'm in media res again, having just finished the animal's legs. I'm ready to set up for this row here, right under the post-it. 
For the fox on the left, I can see that I leave the first chord down and pick up the next two. All the rest are down, apart from the last two. For the dog, I pull the first three chords and the last two. So here we are at the console. I pull the shafts first. One, three, six, eight, nine, and ten, and nineteen. Because I am weaving Easter eggs, none of the handles under my blue tape has been pulled. For my fox on the left, I'll leave the first draw cord down and pick up the next two. Then I'll pick up the rightmost two. For the dog on the right, I'll pick up the first three draw cords, skip the rest, and then pick up the final two. I'm finished with all my poles now and am ready to get weaving. I treadle through my six ground shafts as before, treadling from left to right as I throw my six picks. All too soon I'm finished and ready to go on to the next row. I consider the changes that I will need to make to my pattern shaft pull handles and to the single unit draw cords. First, I make the necessary changes to my pattern shafts. I swap out shaft 6 for 5 and 7 and release shafts 8 and 9. It's helpful to concentrate only on the changes that need to be made. Then, I change my draw cords. Only the fox changes. The pulls for the dog remain the same. And off I go, weaving my six picks. You do get into a rhythm with this process. Pull, change, and weave. Pull, change, and weave. It's magical to watch the patterns I imagined appear on the cloth I've worked so hard to create. Soon my weaving is done, and it's time for the event I've been anticipating for weeks, the big reveal as I unwind my scarf from the cloth beam and see it all at once for the first time. Next, I'll take my cloth to the big table and zigzag the cut ends with my sewing machine. I'll check for skipped threads and weave in broken warp ends. Then, I'll wet finish my scarf and wear it with pride. And that seems like a fitting end to a successful year. I want to thank everybody who've made working on this channel so rewarding. And a special shout out to my subscribers. I'm amazed at your support. It's been really fun and I can't wait to get stuck into next year's projects. I've already got some ideas in mind, including an examination of Bidervand, the long-awaited sequel to Draw Loom Mechanics 101, where we'll be examining lots of different damask ground structures, and a consideration of fiberworks and the workarounds that make it possible to help with designing for the draw loom. I'm also going to make some short videos for folks who've asked me about things like temples, damask shuttles, fixing broken warp threads, and other general weaving arcana. I hope you'll join me.